And uh, I also just want to say, I have a, I, I got a kitten <laughs> and she's a bit, she goes a bit crazy when she hears other people talking on the computer. So there may be an interruption, but it's a very cute interruption. Um, so I decided to title my talk, A Random Walk in Science. And I added Anne Policy to this, this book title. Um, in part because this was one of the first books that my PhD supervisor gave me when I first met him. And it's not a new book, um, but it really made me realize just how human science scientists are. And I think sometimes we forget that part and we are often trained to, um, you know, get our data out there and be objective. And when I was first starting my PhD, this book was really important because it told the human side of so many scientists in history. So I strongly encourage you to read it. Um, and it's still on my shelf. And I often think of my advisor um, who also uh, had a lot of walking meetings with his students. And I, um, you know, during this time when it's hard to see people, I have to say that one of the things I've appreciated most is that anybody who will meet with me outside and go for a walk um, it has been uh, you know, a good place to get exercise, but also to talk to people in person and doing it outside and walking has reminded me of, of something that I really appreciated in my PhD supervisor because we always had to go for a walk. Um, so uh, my will kind of, and that's a random walk and because some of the things I'm gonna talk about are seem a little bit random, but they are sort of stories or vignettes and examples of um, how as somebody with a PhD, I work very much in the policy world um, and how I got there and why I sort of stay in that interface, um, but also a little bit how difficult it is to, to, to do that and, and kind of walk the line of, you know, you know being a credible person in the scientific world, but also making sure that science gets used to solve real world problems, um, which often are much more complex than, uh, than just data. So um, I'm gonna talk a bit, a bit about how and why I work for conservation um, and what I do now. I'll talk about my experience in um, influencing international negotiations, um, because I think it's really important for people to understand uh, just how even as young scientists, um, and I recognize a bunch of names actually, but I know I've met some of you and, and not a lot of other people, but um, uh, just that you can actually make a difference early on in your career if you're in the right space at the right time. Um, I will give you an example. And actually I realized it's a, it's a part of a presentation that I presented at CSPC quite a while ago, just taking how you use a scientific paper to actually influence policy and the steps that takes. Um, some uh, discussion of um, my engagement in, in law and policy reform in Canada that's been a bunch of my work over the last couple of years. And then finally, um, just some examples of community level engagement and how to, um, as, you know, as a scientist who also cares about conservation, how I have learned and continue to learn to make sure that I'm working with communities and developing um, relationships with people. So. I'll, um, I often I often start talks like this with this slide because to me this slide and this picture was really what started my career in marine conservation. Um, I had been dabbling in uh, caring about the ocean. I spent my last year of high school on a tall ship. I knew I wanted to be a scientist, but I kind of thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, Anyway, I didn't really know, but I ended up doing an undergrad at McGill um, in science, and then the first job that I had coming out of that, again not knowing. Uh, I guess I didn't feel I had that usual, you know, female undergrad, uh, not having the confidence to go to a graduate degree, not having a burning question. And so I spent about four years between my um, undergraduate and my PhD um, exploring various things from living in New York City and France and Clackwood Sound um, and also doing working for DFO. Um, trying to count the bycatch in the in-source shore scallop ground, fish scallop fishery in the Bay of Fundy. So this picture is actually, yeah, it's from the, it's from the inner Bay of Fundy. Um, and I was tossed on this boat. It was a DFO survey boat. Um, and my job was to count everything in the bins except for the scallops. And so this was one of the first bins I was faced with. And as you can see, there's a lot of things in it. There's not a lot of scallops. <laughs> um, and I did love taxonomy, um, but I, hadn't had a ton of experience in it. So, uh, but this photo really catapulted me in, in, in the direction to my PhD, even though it was several years later that I applied to do a PhD. One, because um, I was really 
I couldn't believe that this was what happened when we scallop fished. And so the habitat impacts and impacts in other species kind of shocked me. Um, it was a little bit how when I, the first few times I flew over Clackwood Sound and saw, saw the clear cuts. And then I sort of stopped thinking about the clear cuts because they became normalized. But, um, and then in this bin, there's a bunch of kind of, you know, sponges that uh, I didn't know what they were. And I started digging to guides and couldn't find any relevant guides to sponge taxonomy in Atlantic Canada. And so I ended up doing my PhD on, on sponges and on impacts of fishing in the Northwest Atlantic. But um, I keep going back to this picture because it was kind of the thing that was like, oh my God, this is what we're doing to the environment. And I think it turned me into uh, wanting to do something in conservation and then also losing myself in a bit of taxonomy. So, um, um, but it's, I still, I'm still working on the same issues today. So um, I, so I got quite in, interested in the impacts of fishing on the seafloor um, and did some, did a little bit of work for an environmental NGO, the Ecology Action Center in Halifax at the start and worked there for several years um, in the midst of my PhD. But what I was shocked about um, when I was getting ready to do my PhD and kind of just like doing literature reviews and things that we didn't really have a policy. I was like, well, I know we have impacts from fishing, but how are we managing this, right? And, and there was no policy. And so I, you know, a couple of years into my PhD, I realized that there was no policy. It sort of shocked me because I thought if I did the science that I could solve the problem. And uh, it was kind of a revelation to realize that I, that science wasn't the only thing I needed. I, you know, it was early on in my career. I was like, oh, I thought if I you know got to be a scientist, then I could answer questions and solve problems. So I, um, Again, in sort of the random walk, I had a, a bit of a wandering PhD path. Um, don't recommend that for everybody, but it, in the end, it, it served me well, I think. Um, took a little bit too long. But what I did do was get involved in two different things. One was a um, bit of an, an NGO, non-government organization push to get bottom trawling addressed from an international policy perspective that then led to some of my work on Canadian policy. And the other one was uh, taking what I thought would be a six week contract with DFO International Policy um, to do a review of uh, how regional fisheries management organizations and, and those are the organizations that manage fisheries on the high seas, how they had actu actually implemented the United Nations Fish Stocks Agreement. And the United Nations Fish Stocks Agreement was one of the first places where a precautionary approach and ecosystem approach were enshrined in law. So I had a super deep dive into all the regional fisheries management organizations, what they had done since 2006 um, to, yeah, to un just to, to, and I had to go through science documents and policy documents and really got interested in how the translation of science into policy and into management measures happened. Um, so by that time, when I finished what I thought was a six week contract, and it was two years of work that ended up being a, a book, a co-authored book, um, I couldn't, it's like, I couldn't see science without the policy lens. I had to understand how it would ever make a difference. Um, so when I finished my PhD, I ended up going back and working for um, an NGO again, um, because I found that it was the one place that maybe I could be more broad in how I thought about solving problems. And, you know, since that time, I think I took a, another kind of dive into economics. And then I was like, okay, if I know science and the policy and the economics, I should be able to solve problems. And I think in the last few years, I'm just realizing that maybe the only skill I need is psychology and that then I can solve the problems. So um, I'll give you a few examples of um, just how um, I tried to, yeah, I'll go into the international policy piece first and then talk through a paper and how we communicated what was a paper into actually making policy change. Um, so kind of dial back to mid, my mid PhD, I had an opportunity to go to the United Nations. Um, I had no idea what that was, I knew what it was, but I didn't know what it meant. And it was during the time that they were negotiating um, United Nations General Assembly resolutions on sustainable fishing. So the resolutions are always soft law. They're not binding, but they're aware countries kind of agree to do certain things. And if something is in a sustainable fisheries resolution, you can often then um, get it carried out in, in uh, state or national level law and policy eventually, right? So 
at the time there was a big outrage on the impacts of um, bottom trawling on the high seas and bottom trawling on vulnerable communities like sponges and corals and um, some work had been done in Canada to kind of highlight the you know, fact that we did have deep sea corals um, really before 2000s. Fishermen knew we had trees in the ocean, but not many other people. So Halifax actually hosted the first International Deep Sea Coral Symposium, and now that happens, um, I think, every second year and is a big science symposium. But there was, again, on the high seas outside the 200 mile limit, nothing that protected those ecosystems from, from being fished. So I got thrown into this situation and had was told I just had to go lobby delegates and I had had no experience in lobbying anybody or UN delegates, which included, you know, it was quite intimidating, <laughs> but, um, but I learned how to do it really fast because I really cared about the outcome of the resolution because it would mean that we could start to actually protect some of the species, you know, some of the types of species that I had seen, you know, at this point in time, you know, five or six years before coming up in scallop ground surveys and that fishermen had started telling us about and mapping. So that result of the resolution, the ask was for a moratorium on high seas bottom trawling. We didn't get that out of the resolution, but we got something almost just as good if it's fully implemented. And so that resolution was 61.105 and Ultimately, it asked states, um, which are countries and, and RFMOs to just avoid vulnerable marine ecosystems. You have to conduct impact assessments or otherwise not allow fisheries to proceed. And that was huge because for the most part, fisheries are not included in any environmental impact assessments. And in Canada, we don't expect our fisheries to go through impact assessments. Um, and then over the years, you know, people, what happens at the UN is like they have a resolution and then they say, did you do everything you said you would do? And countries are like, yeah, a little bit and they're like okay we urge you to do it now and then like so there's been subsequent resolutions since 2006 that have continued to um have a bit of higher resolution on what we expect countries to do and um countries are all the contracting parties of regional fisheries management organizations and so that resolution would get expressed very clearly in well in the regional fisheries management organizations like the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Organization, which is adjacent to the Canadian high seas and the Northwest Atlantic. Um, and what I ended up doing, just to show you kind of the long haul piece of this is that, you know, I did a PhD on sponges, I presented at NAFO, I got involved in the international policy, I finished my PhD and then worked through NAFO to get some of the areas I'd found um, with high concentration of sponges protected, and then had to, you know, follow up on every scientific council and working group through NAFO and go to the annual meetings and it's you know I'm still doing that and that's like almost 15 years later right so um, um, just quickly um, it's a huge process and just recently we just um, completed uh, like the fourth annual fourth report on whether or not we're actually preventing biodiversity loss in the deep sea and what's going on so just to give you an idea that um, I guess like nothing takes a short amount of time usually and sometimes even if, you know, I have changed jobs and, and left, you know, finished my PhD, changed jobs, and I'm still working on the same issue because to me, it's not finished. And so um, it, it, having a bit of perseverance and dedication to a subject sometimes takes that because the science and policy and the management process often takes a long time. I think we know that from things like, you know, addressing climate change as an example. Um, but in part of all this work, it was never just scientists. It was often NGOs, it was economists, it was, you know, good delegates from countries. It was, um, it, it was NGOs as well, but it was like a whole complex. And then the media, of course, has a role to play. So um, the, whole, the complexity of like the conservation ecosystem, the science policy ecosystem is something that kind of constantly takes, um, yeah, just paying attention to, I guess. Um, oh, the next one. So this example, I'm just going to give a, an example of a published paper to policy and um, to policy change. This is a paper that my colleague Julia Baum and myself and um, her honor student and another colleague did in 2015. And it really came out of my observations of being at the table at fisheries management um, advisory committees that science wasn't being taken into account all the time and maybe I was naive to think it would um, but that species that were not being listed species that were endangered but not listed under the fisheries under the species at risk act were not also then being taken care of under the fisheries act um, and I'm going to tell this story because it leads into my work on the fisheries act over the last few years 
so we published a paper in CJFAS. Um, you know, it's not a, it wasn't a revolutionary paper or anything, but what we did was made a real um, effort to make sure that in, in the recommendations from the paper, we were very clear on policy pieces. So this is a terrible way to show this table, but the, the message is more that um, the results of the paper were scientific, but the discussion was a way to fix the process in not following um, following science advice around how we manage species that are considered threatened or endangered. So we put that in the paper, um, so it was there, but then we took um, the results of the paper and also made sure we were communicating them broadly. So we were on quirks and quarks. We did a, had a piece in iPolitics. We put out a four pager that anybody who doesn't have access to CJFAS could read and it was in very plain language. Um, then we made infographics and pulled out tables and we, you know, would send those to policymakers instead of just the paper or the paper in addition to these very simple ways of understanding the, uh, the results. So all this to say is just like communicating the science is vital. And in my experience, sometimes scientists communicate the science that they think is important and they communicate it in a way that they think is important, but there's a real art to um, sometimes putting yourself aside and your own research aside and communicating the, pol the, the science that's important at the policy level. And it's a, it's a fine line, but there's scientists who are really good at doing it. And there's scientists who sometimes, you know, I've seen them present at the United Nations or different fora and it, they, it goes a little bit off the rails because they didn't quite understand the context within which they were um, talking about their science. So um, anyway, and putting it in really digestible formats. Um, I think the other tools we used were um, presentation to fisheries managers, presentation to species at risk staff, presentation to indigenous organizations, taking it to specific species advisory committees, um, and then also presenting it at more academic conferences. But I guess this is all to say that publishing a paper is never enough. <laughs> um, and if you want to actually have an influence in, in policy, you really publishing the paper is the first part. And then there's a whole other kind of supply chain in order to get that information out there. And that's something that um, I didn't learn a lot about in my PhD. I learned maybe by example from my advisor who did some of that, but it wasn't taught to me. And I think it's being taught more now. Um, but it was a really, it was a good learning curve for me to be like how to present information in many different ways. Um, and so, yeah, and anyway, ultimately we then used um, the mandate that had been in 2015 to the fisheries minister. And we presented the mandate back to the fisheries managers when we were presenting our paper so that they could understand that we were actually also, you know, really interested in helping them um, achieve that mandate. Um, anyway, so some lessons learned, um, which I've already talked a few of them about, but but um, one piece we also did was before we published the paper, we engaged with the advise with the fisheries managers and scientists and sent them drafts so that when it was out in the public, they were they already knew about it. They weren't surprised. Um, and then just communicate it a bunch of times. And then when you think you're done communicating it, communicate it again. And I'm still working on implementing the recommendations of this paper. Um, so the other, this, the, the paper kind of, and, and, and some of the work that, um, you know, originally collecting the data on the inshore scale ground survey um, made me get really involved in the Fisheries Act modernization. Um, because by then I kind of understood how the Fisheries Act needed to be written and what needed to be in it in order for the science that was being developed to be relevant. And that includes, you know, the, the Fisheries Act did not have the precautionary approach or ecosystem approach in it. Um, it hadn't really had a major overhaul since 1868. So this was an opportunity to really do it right. And the government had said, you know, we're gonna restore lost protections that had been removed by the previous government to fish habitat, but also that we were gonna modernize. And so, myself and others thought it was a real opportunity to, to really modernize. And it took a lot of work. It was you know, really three years of work um, and communication with lawmakers and members of parliament and scientists and the fishing industry and indigenous rights holders. And then again and again and again. And in the end, you know, um, we got a really good fisheries act in, for the most part in Canada and it's modernized. And now the task is um, implementing it but for the first time in the Fisheries Act, it now mandates rebuilding fisheries. 
it references section 35 of the constitution to uphold indigenous rights. There is a comprehensive section two, which lists the things that um, fisheries, the fishery, the minister has to, may take into account. May is an important word there. Um, and one thing I've realized recently that we forgot to make sure was in there was accountability for those things that are taken into account and accountability for decision-making. But luckily um, we did get a five-year review in the act. So it won't ever, you know, it won't ever go so long as it did without a, a, a thinking of whether or not it's working. So the five-year review, I'm already planning for that decision-making and accountability to be in there. And I will just also say that um, the regulatory process under that act is still ongoing. And I, I honestly see the implementation is like, you know, it's the next 20 years of my career if I last that long. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's just a, a, an example of getting deep, deeply involved in law and policy so that it can start to um, respond better to the science that's being developed. Um, just as a um, sort of, this isn't an aside, but one thing I've also learned is you all, you always have to have your peripheral vision on. And one thing that was happening at the same time as the Fisheries Act was um, just a quick kind of update to the Oceans Act. Um, Canada had committed also to um, um, protecting 10% of its oceans by 2020. It's actually exceeded that, um, but they realized that that was gonna be hard because protected areas under the Oceans Act were taking six to eight years to complete. So they just wanted to do a legal tweak um, to the Oceans Act to make the process more efficient and to allow for interim protections and ecosystem considerations. And those of us who were working on these laws really thought that the Fisheries Act would be far more difficult once it got to the final um, parliamentary and Senate committees. But in actual fact, the Oceans Act was much more difficult. And so it was the same Senate committee dealing with these two acts and just had to really triangulate on the individuals on the committee to make sure that one didn't hold up the other. So maybe it's just a lesson on that. Like sometimes unexpected things happen. We fully whole like back down to the ground <laughs> um, um, from legislative processes and, and thinking about those processes in terms of how we implement science. Um, another thing that I do, um, particularly now that I work with Oceans North that works a lot with indigenous communities, um, is that we make sure we are doing things in community. And so one side of this slide is with people on the seashore and that was with students um, when we were doing a seashore transect and also sampling for microplastics and while the data coming out of both of those things is not mind-blowing um I mean microplastics are everywhere and so we can keep sampling and we'll still find them everywhere but it really got people at the community level engaged in answering questions that they had and the more that um you know, I work with indigenous communities, particularly in the north and in Nunatiavu, which is the um, Inuit land claim in Labrador, um, realizing that answering questions that people have is very important. And I've been involved in an Ocean Frontier Institute project um, where the knowledge and science outcomes are supposed to be co-developed, but it's been really interesting to watch the, like the grant application process actually required all the hypotheses and research questions to be established and then a work plan. And it's very hard to do co-development with communities if your work plan and your science application already has to be established. So I think um, we have to actually change some of our structures if we really want to get to real collaboration between communities and the science community. Um, so one example of something we did is the next, the other two pictures is um, we realized that the community actually really cared about all the empty oil barrels that were in Torngat National Park um, because the oil barrels and gas fuel barrels were on land that the, belonged to the Nunatsiavut. It, it wasn't, it's not quite in the park, the park leases it. And these barrels had just accumulated over the decade from when the park was established. And so um, that became like, it never, you know, we were trying to do research in the community, but the community kept saying, well, there's the park. <laughs> and we're like, what do you mean? Like, well, there's the park, there's the stuff in the park. And so this past summer, um, in part because we had strong community partners and we could not travel, we did end up doing a pretty full cleanup and removed about 400 barrels of em empty barrels and then um, of, of fuel barrels from that park and they got recycled and were taken to Goose Bay. So. Again, it's like um, 
you know, I, I work for a conservation organization and I am a scientist, but listening and hearing people on the ground to understand what's important to them is something that I'm learning more and more about every day. But then thinking about how do we take those relationships to then do scientific research and ask questions and then take that research and information and results to help the communities inform policy and decisions that are made, um, you know, for and by them. Um, Guess I'll just finish um, my random walk. Um, is it's I find I struggle a lot, and it's really hard time to hard to have time to be a scientist. I try to publish or co like co-publish a paper once a year, twice a year, um, if possible, so that I maintain some credibility. Um, in recent experiences, I found that people who are just in academia are frustrated because I'm slow, and I think they don't recognize that there's lot that, that you know doing lots of other things. Um, and then the other piece is uh, just trying to keep up on the latest science. And um, one, I'll talk a little bit about this current Mi'kmaq fishery in a second, but, but being up to date on science is really important. It's hard to always find time to do that, but I really do try and make time. Um, the other thing I would just say in the science policy interface is um, constantly triangulating between the outcome that you want and how you get there. So it's kind of having a really full toolbox and knowing what tool to use when, and if one tool doesn't work, knowing that you have others. So it's really creative and never ever a straight line. Um, quick example is um, we were working quite hard on a Western Hudson Bay protected area because it's the largest population of belugas in the world. And there was you know, some progress and then it stopped completely. And the reason why it stopped completely was because the rail line to, to Churchill um, had a huge erosion and was not working. So essentially any of the work we were doing as a conservation organization would not go forward until the rail line was fixed, which is totally out of our control. So just being able to kind of, you know, again, it gets back to that peripheral vision. What else is happening that may preclude the outcome you want to happen, whether it's, um, you know, integrating science into policy or getting that policy implemented or working with communities. Um, the other thing that I found recently is um, because I now have experience in international policy and law and national policy and law on fisheries and oceans, I often get asked by scientists who work for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, what, I, what do I think Canada's obligations are? Can I find a section in the act? Do I know, you know where to find Canada said it would do this? And I usually do know because I've, I've um, spent a lot of time in that area. So that, that's a, uh, something that I didn't think I would be useful at, but I've, it's, I've gotten a lot of questions lately on it. Um, so I guess I would just say, you know, it's hard doing this on Zoom because you can't make eye contact and I can't see people's faces or anything. Um, but, you know, for people kind of thinking about going into this crazy, uh, you know, it's a morass of science policy, um, is following your instincts really important and recognizing that choices are, are human. And so being able to feel that a little bit, um, I, I often rely on um, um, just yeah, how I feel about something to make my next decision. Um, another thing that I can't emphasize enough is building and keeping relationships and networks. And I'll just speak quickly to the current um, issue in Southwest Nova Scotia on Mi'kmaq and, and, and non-Indigenous fishers. And uh, you know, I've made a stand that I stand up for First Nations rights, but I also um, have a lot of uh, friends and colleagues in the non-Indigenous fishery and keeping those relationships over the last month or so has taken a lot of work, um, but I know that I love conservation work, I maintain those relationships. And, and a, another little story, when oceans, when everything shut down with COVID, Oceans North um, really quickly pivoted and we took all of our planned travel funds for the next year and we invested them directly in communities um, to basically do whatever indigenous and Northern communities wanted, uh, wanted from us. Sometimes it was iPads, sometimes it was like funding the lunch program that used to be at the school. Sometimes it was getting uh, cribs for the women's shelter in Winnipeg. We just pivoted immediately because we knew that if we weren't there as an ally um, during a different crisis, we couldn't necessarily come back and continue our conservation work. Um, so yeah, and just finally, like I just view my day-to-day -day work always as problem solving. Um, and I think I've already said this, but it's just not a straightforward path. I have 
some staff that I work with who are always like, well, what do I do next? And I, and I have to say, I don't know. Like you have to go try like three or four things. And, and if one of them, if one of them works, that's great. But um, there's, you know, there's often not the next answer, but you go to the next step and see if that works. And you go to the next step and see if that works. And all of this is in a context of, um, you know, our jobs are always on soft money. It's year to year. Uh, you get funded if you complete their deliverables. And sometimes there's reasons why you just can't, they're totally external. Um, so um, I think, yeah, just finally, the other piece is just getting out to communities, I, which is really hard during COVID, <laughs> um, a little bit easier in the Atlantic bubble, but I really um, think it's really important to people, scientists and students and even people who work on just policy to be on the wharves um, in the communities. Um, you know, wherever you're working, because so often I see scientists do research about a community, but not have communicated that research to the community um, and made relationships there. And it takes a lot of work. And I think as scientists, we're getting a lot better at it, but I can't emphasize enough, like just being in places where people are, makes all of your work much more relevant. Um, and then finally, I might just end on the importance of also taking you know, I, I sort of live and breathe my work. I don't have a balance in it, um, especially these days. It, it keeps me up at night, but um, making, you know, maybe this is, I don't know, sort of cliche, but making the time to actually go and be in the ecosystem that you care about, um, I found really does kind of recharge me. And I, I think we've all learned that with the current pandemic, that being outside and being in places that make us feel good, make the, um, at least make the work that I do much more bearable and worthwhile and remind me why I do it. So um, in these days when we are always in front of screens all the time, um, I constantly look back to my pictures of the summer and um, um, really appreciate that I actually had the freedom that I do to uh, yeah, be on the ocean and near the ocean. Um, so with that, I think yeah, I will finish and take any questions. Thank you. That was a fascinating talk, uh, Dr. Fuller. And we walked with you along the way of the coastal line. And that was beautiful. And uh, with that, we open up for questions and answers. I just want to uh, note that the session is being recorded by uh, Mupar. And if you don't want to capture your, uh, your picture being captured in the recording, you can ask your question in the chat line and we'll read your question. But thank you very much. And uh, there is one question already from Tiffany. Um, do you want me to read that for you, Susanna? Or uh, I can read it. Can everybody else see it? Yeah. Can I? Okay. So let me just read it for the sake of you know uh, presentation. And uh, so uh, Tiffany is asking. I was just wondering, as someone with a lot of ties everywhere, how to yeah. Uh, how do you most effectively communicate to stakeholders that there is a roadblock preventing you from progressing forward, especially when you want to help but are unable? Um, yeah, you know, I think that question is relevant to, um, it, it very much, what you do with stakeholders is, depends on the issue. And I, you know, I've been thinking a lot, that kind of question has come up a lot when I think about my role as somebody who works for a conservation organization, um, in this current um, indigenous versus non-indigenous fisheries conflict, um, trying to understand my role and being very careful about it. I think sometimes when you want to help, but you can't, you just stand back, but, in, but you make sure that people know that you're there if they need something, right? Um, sometimes that's the most effective thing. Um, and sometimes you just be really honest, like you like, we can't move forward, uh, you know, quick example, I was at a fisheries meeting and I was really trying to get something done. And I really thought it was gonna happen at that meeting. And I've been working on it for years and the whole fishing industry agreed. And it was the day that Gerald Butts resigned. And we were right in the middle of like a really difficult conversation. And as soon as everybody saw that news come across their, their phones, like everybody gave up on the difficult conversation we were having and there was nothing I could do about it. And I was like, all right, well, let's just go have chips and beer because we're all distracted and this like issue has like kept us from being able to keep going. So there's always things that are in the way. And I think it's just, again, I would go back to gut feeling and, and then letting people know you're there and when they need you, they can call on you. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. Any other question? You can type your question or raise your hand uh, in the participant section and, uh, and you can speak up or show your face. Yes, speak up, please go ahead. Hi, Susanna, um, I love the talk. I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit more on the difficulties of implementation. I once worked um, a little bit in Cambodia where we made some really good progress with the government where they were with us against um, all the illegal trawling vessels that were going on in the area. And we made some really good policies, but there was no funding for um, implementation. They actually gave us a boat and a gun and said, go at her. Um, so our next step was sort of to approach international agencies, less so much about like physically stopping these ships, but about getting to the heart of the issue, which is the money and the wallets. Um, but I was wondering if you could sort of expand a little bit about the difficulties of these international scenarios. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard. We commit to all kinds of things that we don't implement. Um, I think it helps to have other people who are doing it with you. It helps to have, um, someone else, especially at the state level, it helps to have some somebody shining the light on what's happening, that there was a policy that's not being implemented. I think sometimes, you know, I've done a lot of work on implement policy implementation and I don't get paid for it. It's not, I don't have funding for it, but it's like, I can't stand to not see it done. <laughs> and so um, I, yeah, it's hard and it sometimes depends on the situation and the time frame. But I think the more you can get allies, particularly in the community to, to, to show people how they can hold government accountable, lots of people don't know how to do that, right? They say, well, we passed a law, well, we'll just assume government will do it. Well, you know, especially in developing countries, there's lots of challenges to that. So um, yeah, I don't know if that's a straightforward answer. I, I think it's sometimes being persistent or passing off your persistence to other people who are able to be there for the long, the long haul. And then noting that priorities change, right? So. It's not easy. Thanks. Yeah, there is no right solution. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Julie. Thanks, Susanna. I'm interested. I'm interested in hearing your advice for building those networks beyond science. What could graduate students be doing to really foster those relationships? Uh, yeah, I think it's a hard question to ask in COVID times when, like, <laughs> creating new networks is really hard because. Uh, but maintaining networks can be done. I think, um, you know, one, it's meeting people in person. I still think, you know, you can create relationships over email and text and phone calls, but thinking about who is important in those networks. And sometimes it's your personal network that can be important. Um, you know, I work on fisheries right now with a guy that I was in a co-op house with when I was five years old and my mother was a graduate student. I would have no idea when I was five that that person who shared, you know, was in the downstairs bedroom doing his master's was going to be really important in my career. But I always kept up that relationship somehow. And then suddenly he walked into my office one day and he's like, hey, you want to work on fisheries issues like 30 years later, right? So I, I think it's kind of understanding your personal networks. And I, you know, I, I, again, I think all the way that we communicate these days for the technology doesn't actually help form those. And so I just encourage people to like, if, so, if you think somebody's interesting, reach out to them, right? Say, do you want to help? Let's go have a coffee. Let's have a beer. I'm, I'm interested in what you're doing right? or your, you know, elected officials. Like it's really hard to have coffee with people right now, but that's why I was talking about walks. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I just think keeping it on your mind all the time, which is really hard when you're deep trying to finish your thesis. Um, but using conferences when they're not virtual um, and using experiences where you are around other people to just really talk to people and make those connections and take business cards because you never know when you just meet, meet to follow up with that person, right? Um, yeah, and then be strategic, right? You can't be really friendly with everybody. So think about who you need on, in, the, you know, in the broader vision if you have one or who's gonna be important later on because you never really know, right? Thank you. Any other question for Susanna? You can unmute yourself or uh, turn on your camera if you want to, or, or write your question in the chat. Hi, Susanna. Um, I just, it's more of a comment really. I just wanted to say thank you for that presentation and particularly for sharing that, you know, paths aren't always straightforward. Um, and sometimes you don't know what's going to happen, you know, what's 
going to help you in the future or um, I really liked your comment about kind of keeping the full toolbox and building that up. I think that's that's something that um, is really helpful for for students and all of us, um, really. So I, it's just more of a thank you. But uh, yeah, yeah. And presentation. You know, one thing I said, you can keep the full toolbox, but you don't have to own the workshop, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's like, you know, you don't you. So I think that's important because otherwise we like I find trying to do it all really hard. Um, mm -hmm. And we don't all, you don't all have to do it all. Like that's why like having, if you're a policymaker, have a relationship with scientists and have a relationship with lawmakers, like figure out who else you need in that workshop, right? So that your toolbox is effective. Great, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Any other question for Susanna? <laughs> if I may have uh, one question, uh, and that is, uh, you have some international experience, obviously, uh, in comparing uh, the what, what the mechanisms of con uh, connection between science and policy, taking scientific evidence into the policy making in your uh, field, compared to the other countries, similar countries, obviously. And could you just do, uh, give us some, you know, approximate assessment, how we are doing, where are the areas that are, uh, uh, we excel and we do well, where are the, our weaknesses compared to the other countries? Um, that's a tricky one because most of my experience is at the UN where it's like global policy versus like state level. Um, but I can say where Canada has some strengths and I will just speak to fisheries and oceans because that's what I know best, but we do have a strong like, science advisory process, which is, I think, quite good, needs, always needs fixing, but it, it's good. Um, I think like any country where we still struggle is taking that science advice into management and then being clear on why we make the decisions, right? And most decisions are political um, or, or it's politics or economics usually trump science, no matter how much we don't want it to. And I don't think any country is free of that, right? Everything, once you get to a government level is a political decision. Um, and yeah, so I, I think Canada is to some extent doing a better job. I think making sure that scientists can speak freely is really important. Um, and I, you know, I think some stuff in the European Union, like I've been following their, um, their biodiversity strategy, it's really good, it's informed by science. They've done an interesting job in their funding for their Horizon 2020 program, which, which was a blue economy science bucket, but they forced um, every project funded under that to develop policy briefs and to engage policymakers. I haven't really seen that like in our, you know, like in NSERC, for example, or so um, maybe it's happening a bit more, but I was really impressed with how they did that because then you end up with policymakers already understanding the research that's just been done and can very rapidly um, um, put it into policy or include it in policy, right? I think we have a bit of a lag time on that. And I also think in Canada, we have trouble bringing academic and government scientists science together. Um, I remember being shocked when I went to my first, you know, CSAS process and it was really all government science being presented. And I was like, but there's all these, like, there's journals on this thing. Like, th there's so many papers out there. Um, so I think how we merge our academic findings with our government science and come up with good policy advice. At the same time, I think it's very hard because scientists, like we give science advice, we don't give management advice, right? So, and I see scientists being sidelined in, you know, in Canada's national and international processes all the time too, right? Because what they're telling them is not what's the easy management decision. So I don't think we're unique in that, um, but I right. think Europe has a bit more of a straight line. Um, and I would have said US a, a few years ago, but right now they're having a few challenges. Okay, that's good. Uh, we have another question from Julie, and uh, that is um, uh, just out of uh, curiosity, what was it that made changes to the Ocean Act more contentious than the Fisheries Act okay. at the time? That's an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, so um, that was one particular senator who did not like it and did not like the idea of interim protection and decided to make it his um, 
yeah, he was going to make it very difficult to get that Oceans Act through and raise the idea of interprotections as um, potentially against uh, indigenous sovereignty. So that was why. And he happened to be on the um, Fisheries and Oceans Committee. And so, yeah, that, that was why. And so, it, yeah, it was just one person and he was trying to make it very difficult, but we figured out a way of, yeah, getting through there by just basically reaching out to all the other senators and explaining why that it did not actually undermine indigenous sovereignty because we still had in um, impact benefit agreements and um, co-designation of areas. So, yeah. Right, and uh, one question for, uh, of my curiosity, and that is you yourself or uh, members of your organizations have ever been called to uh, be a witness in committees in the House or in Senate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, quite quite a bit. I've been at the Standing Committee on Fisheries and Oceans several times, um, in the Senate um, also several times, yeah. And it's, um, you get better at doing it over time. Um, one of the things I find challenging about it is that you are, it's essentially political pinball. And so you mm -hmm. need to be very aware of who is on the committee, what questions they might, they might ask, and I've learned to really follow the all the questions. Like I always watch the entire hearings or, or try and go to the entire hearing on that subject so that I can relate my commentary back to what they've already heard. And uh, I can be aware of any kind of, you know, questions, right? Like, well, where do you get your funding from anyways? Or why, you know what I mean? Sometimes they'll fling personal things at you that you kind of need to be strong about. Um, and and then you need to know what they're hearing from other people. Great, uh, Susanna. We would love to hear uh, more details on that in another session uh, later on, because that would be uh, perhaps interesting for some of the audience uh, at, uh, uh, at a different function. But well, thank you. That's great. Any other questions for Susanna? Okay. I, I don't see any uh raised hand and i do not see any questions so uh stephanie is that uh i think we can um uh, end the session is that uh, uh is that right stephanie and laura please help me with that if uh, we can go to a break at this point sure absolutely we can go into our break and then perhaps if there's anyone who wants to hang around for a little bit in the break time and to chat with Susanna a little bit we'll turn off the recording and maybe Susanna if you don't mind staying for a little bit of extra time um yeah. if, if you have any questions there you can go ahead and ask that okay thank you uh I just want to thank Susanna Fleur on behalf of the participants for this uh, fascinating talk we, we were really inspired that was very interesting and uh, thank you for being with us today Susanna will remain on the call for another two, three minutes in case if you come up with other questions and feel free to ask her. Uh, we'll end the recording at this point and this is uh, the break time. Now we'll be, be at back at uh, 2.30 uh, for the panel uh, of career on science uh, policy. And a couple of professionals will talk about their experience uh, and how they got into science policy and practicing it. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and we'll we'll be uh, connecting soon. Thank you.